This is Thursday, April 5th, 2012. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Ronald Broderick. Welcome, Ron. Thank you. Okay. May I ask when you were born? I was born on September 27, 1919. And where were you born? In Hastings, Nebraska. And where is Hastings? Hastings is in south central Nebraska, near where my parents lived. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And where do you currently live? I live in Wayland. Your marital status? Uh, I'm a widower. And do you have children? I have. Mm -hmm. All right. And grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Excellent. Uh, tell us a little bit about life in Hastings, Nebraska before the war. <laughs> I didn't actually live in Hastings, but that's where I was born. I was born, I mean, I lived on a farm, mm -hmm. my parents' farm, which had been homesteaded my, by my grandfather back in the late 1800s. And uh, so I grew up on the farm, mm -hmm. went to a one-room country school. We had 20. 20 kids in uh, eight grades there. And like I always tell people, if you didn't learn it after you heard it eight times, you were hopeless. So, <laughs> <laughs> but it was a good school, and then I went to high school there. Mm -hmm. And then University of Nebraska. Mm -hmm. Having grown up on a farm, did you want to continue with farming? Or did you think well, of another? I, at the time, I didn't, mm -hmm. uh, partly because my older brother was really training to be a professional farmer. He'd been, went all through ag college and mm -hmm. worked on the farm and was uh, natural to take it over. And I thought it would be better if I went and did something else. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. And what was your major at Nebraska? Uh, chemistry and biology. Mm -hmm. So what were you doing when war broke out? Well, I was back in uh, Boston at graduate school, and mm -hmm. uh, I actually, uh, I was kind of at loose end, so I, it looked like uh, we were going to be getting into a war. Mm -hmm. or I thought it would be good to make a choice rather than have somebody else tell me where to go. Mm -hmm. So I uh, looked into Navy Flight School and uh, ended up joining that in, uh, in the early fall of 1941 and uh, was started flight training out here at Squantum, which had a, uh -huh. it's in Quincy, it was, there was an air, a Navy air, mm -hmm. air station out there at the time. So. so you were actually in Boston. What was that like for you, being a Nebraska farm boy? <laughs> Oh, I, I liked it. Uh -huh. I, I liked Boston. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, what do you remember about Pearl Harbor Day? When well, uh, I had uh, gotten acquainted with a, a girl and, mm -hmm. uh, in West Bridgewater, and I was out there having Sunday dinner, and uh, it was about, well, I, I guess it was around 2 o'clock here when mm -hmm. We first heard about it, and uh, uh, I didn't really know exactly where Pearl Harbor was. I knew it was out in the Pacific someplace, mm -hmm. but uh, it was that was a big, big event, and we knew right away it was going to be a big change. What I remember most from that day is that was the day my wife and I, kind of, my wife to be, mm -hmm. kind of decided we liked each other. So. <laughs> that was, Pearl Harbor was big in more ways than one oh. for me. <laughs> okay. So tell us what happened afterward. Uh, we got called back to Squantum, and uh, her, uh, of course everything was quite confused. Uh, the rumor was that the Japanese were going to come and uh, attack us from the Atlantic Ocean. Mm -hmm. So we were hiding down behind the seawall there and uh, waiting for the attack. Of course. In retrospect, that was uh, not mm -hmm. not possible. So, 
So at this point, you, are you officially in the Navy? Or? At that time I was, yes. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was full time then. Started mm -hmm. flight training in Squantum. And how long were you in flight training? Well, I was out here for a couple of months and then uh, went to Jacksonville, Florida in a, in a couple of stages. And I spent until uh, through June of 1942 in flight training in Jacksonville. And what were you training on? Well, we started out, actually in Squantum, we were flying the old biplanes. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, in Jacksonville, we went to more and more advanced aircraft, and I ended up flying the, the large seaplanes. The, they called them PBYs, that mm -hmm. stands for uh, patrol bomber. So how did you like flying? Oh, That's I love flying. Yeah. Of course, mm -hmm. like a lot of kids, I was always fascinated by it. No. Okay. Yeah. And, and not only this, the driving the thing, but all the all the technology of it. Mm -hmm. There was, uh, you know, airplanes are pretty complex. They have so many different systems that you have to learn. And, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. Is there anything else you remember about your flight training? Did you go with, like through a basic training or? Well, uh, it was sort of like going to college. We had a lot of classwork and not, not too much military. Of course, we had to learn the military rules and whatnot, mm -hmm. but we didn't have much in the way of uh, marching or anything like that. It was mm -hmm. more like college. And then as we went on more in advanced, like when I got through Jacksonville, I went to San Diego for a few months uh, for more advanced training, and in a way, we were kind of on our own there. We had airplanes at our disposal, and we had to go through a curriculum there. So. Mm -hmm. And were you holding a rank at the time of your training? Were you were like a an ensign, a lieutenant? Uh, when I got to in Florida, I became an ensign. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And tell us what happened after San Diego. Uh, then I was assigned to a squadron, which was already in the Pacific. That's, that's the uh, patrol squadron, VP-91. Mm -hmm. And uh, we uh, went out there by sea, which took about a month. And, uh, As I joined... in ships? <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we went by way of... Hawaii, mm -hmm. and then to, uh, I think I joined the squadron in uh, an island called Espiritu Santo in the New Hebrides. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was, that was a long month of playing bridge on the ship. <laughs> Tough duty. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, here you are, a Nebraska farm boy. You've seen Boston, you've seen Jacksonville, and now you've seen a whole bit of the Pacific Ocean. Yeah. How were you playing bridge? Oh, just fair. Okay. So you get to the New Hebrides, and tell us what happened after that. Well, I joined the squadron there, and mm -hmm. uh, this was uh, just after our forces had landed on Guadalcanal, and. Uh, Things weren't going very well at that time. We were, we were losing, mm -hmm. and, but we, uh, our, our, we did a lot of different things in our squadron. Basically, it was patrol, which means typically we would go out on a straight line out across the mm -hmm. Pacific for about a thousand miles, and then cut across. 40 miles and back. So we, we flew a, a little skinny piece of pie mm -hmm. every day and or every, oh, constantly. And uh, there would be one in our sector and then several others either side of that sector. So we uh, covered a whole fan-shaped area of ocean, uh, f essentially full time, mm -hmm. day and night, looking principally for uh, enemy uh, ships and task forces. 
that would be coming in to attack. Well, that, that was the primary duty, but we did uh, many, many other things. So these, these airplanes were straight seaplanes. We didn't have wheels, so we had to land in the water. But that gave us an opportunity to go places that no one else could go because there weren't airstrips at that time. Right. The land planes couldn't do that. So we got to see a lot of territory that most people didn't see. First of all, how big uh, was the squadron? How many men? We had uh, 12 airplanes and probably two crews per plane and 11 man crew, so mm -hmm. whatever that comes to, mm -hmm. 150, 200. Uh. And you were telling me before the interview that you were not only a pilot, but also a navigator. Tell us how that worked out. Well, we were, tr our training was Pilot flight training included navigation, and uh, so in the, when we were out in the Pacific, uh, of course there were no no radio aids or anything like that. We had radio silence except unless unless we saw something that had to be reported, then we then we could call back. Otherwise, we were strictly on our own for the navigating, and uh, we were well trained, so we never had any problem. Some the other services, when they would come out, they wouldn't have had the good training and they would get lost. So one of our numerous jobs was to rescue those guys when they went down at sea, <laughs> try to rescue them. <laughs> okay. It wasn't funny, but uh, somehow it, mm -hmm. sometimes it seemed funny. I think there was a tension there that mm. when you'd get somebody, you'd, you'd kind of relax and make jokes about it, yeah, and uh, you know, it wasn't basically mm -hmm. funny, no. Are there any uh, missions that stick out in your mind during the, uh, from this period? Um, yeah, a couple. Uh, there was one where uh, we were, we'd go from New Hebrides up through the Solomons, Guadalcanal mm -hmm. and so on, and as a matter of fact, we would go on to advanced places and maybe a little island and we'd have a, mm -hmm. a small ship there to, uh, to live on. Mm -hmm. and, or we'd have a base, we had one base at a place called Tulagi, which is just across the channel from Guadalcanal. Mm -hmm. And we'd fly out of there. And then one of the fairly early flights I made was, uh, there was a, an island called New Georgia, which mm -hmm. was essentially next up from Guadalcanal. And uh, it was kind of a funny story. A lot of these islands had plantations, coconut plantations on them. And from the air, you could tell they were plantations because the trees are all nicely lined up in rows. And some sharp-eyed photo interpreter noticed a strange thing about one of those plantations. It turns out what was happening, the, the Japanese had taken these trees and mounted them on wheels, and at night they'd roll the trees out of the way and they were building an airstrip there. And in the wow. daytime they'd roll the trees back and you wouldn't see it, but this guy caught it. So I was in the first plane that went up there at night to bomb those guys while they were building your airstrip. And, uh, so that was kind of a memorable mm. occasion. It was memorable in more ways than one because coming back we encountered some extremely heavy thunderstorms and mm -hmm. of course we had no radar or anything so we by dumb luck would just fly right through them. It was terribly mm -hmm. rough and uh, so that was, that was a long night. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so you were uh, doing more than navigating and piloting, you were also dropping bombs. We did bombs. Mm -hmm. We carried torpedoes, although I don't think we ever dropped one. Mm -hmm. And we carried uh, anti-submarine equipment. Mm -hmm. the, 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 I was down there, out there for two tours. Our second tour, we had some special, they call it an MAD, Magnetic Airborne Detector, which would detect a submarine by its magnetic field when it was submerged. So we went through a lot of training on mm -hmm. that and 
carried that equipment, but I don't think we ever got a submarine. And, uh, okay. But that was one of the numerous activities we went through. Yeah. So you mentioned two tours. How long did your first tour last? I was only there about, I, I could look it up, I think maybe four or five months. Four or five months? Yeah. My uh, plane commander, I was just a co-pilot at that time, my plane commander developed a, a bad rash from the tropic mm -hmm. conditions and uh, he had to get back to the States to get that taken care of so we were with him and uh, so, so I didn't stay there very long. No. Did the tropic conditions affect you in any way? No, not particularly, no. So you're back stateside now? Oh, with, with the yeah, back, mm -hmm. back to stateside. It wasn't uh, without incident on the way. We stopped in Hawaii mm -hmm. and had uh, about 10 days while they tried to patch up our airplanes uh, well enough to fly them back to mm -hmm. California so they could be used as trainers. Mm -hmm. And there, there were three of us on the flight that night uh, that's a long trip. That's the longest trip anywhere in the mm. world, practically, without any mm. islands in between. And in those days, it was uh, extreme for us to go that distance. Mm. And there were three of us in a kind of a loose formation in the middle of the night, heading for San Diego. And uh, something happened to one of them. He he peeled off, and you know, with this 11-man crew, and that's the last we ever heard of them. When, Oh we don't. We never did. Never did know what happened. Mm -hmm. But uh, so they didn't do that anymore to try to have those old airplanes fly back. It just wasn't worth it. So mm -hmm. uh, anyway, we came back and uh, then eventually the whole squadron made it back and we reformed, got new airplanes in San Diego and went on from there. Okay. Uh, and what were the new planes? The same PBYs, mm -hmm. seaplanes. That, that, that plane that came in two versions, one had landing gear, so oh. you could land it either on water or on land, but ours were straight seaplanes, mm -hmm. uh, which had the advantage of more range because right. uh, you could carry fuel instead of those big heavy wheels, mm -hmm. so you could get more range. So. So what time are we talking about now, um, 1943 when you started your second tour? I went out there mm -hmm. in uh, late summer of 42 and came back, I could look it up, I think mm -hmm. probably about February. And then we were in San Diego um, most of the summer, I would think. Mm -hmm. And then we flew to back to Hawaii and we were in oh, uh, Kaneohe, which is on Oahu, mm -hmm. uh, for a while, which I can't remember. It might have been six weeks or so. Mm -hmm. And then we went right back down to that same area around the Solomons. Okay. And we spent uh, close to a year down there that time. Uh, so now we're talking around the fall of 1943? We left. Uh, uh, yeah, we left San Diego, uh, I guess, in the fall of 43. Okay. I have it in my logbook. I, mm -hmm. I should have brought that, and I could look it up exactly. And we were out there till uh, uh, probably early summer of 44 or something like okay. that. Yeah, maybe maybe middle of the summer, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you start your second tour, and the war in the Pacific has shifted somewhat? Tell us about that. Well, the, the war was gradually moving up island by island, mm -hmm. up through the Solomons, and um, the, the heaviest activity late in that second tour was up on uh, uh, New Britain, Bougainville, we had big landing, marine landings on Bougainville, Marine and Army, I think. And uh, then the, the Japanese had a big Navy base 
at the northern tip of New Britain, which mm -hmm. extends up from New Guinea, if you have the map. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, we were attacking, our, our forces were attacking that big Navy base. Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of activity in that area. And, and we worked up, the farthest I got was in the Admiralty Islands, which is a little bit farther north of that. And uh, so uh, we were there until I came home. Uh, okay. And you were pretty much doing pretty much the same thing, pilot, navigator, bombing? Bombing, and we did rescue work. We did uh, uh, delivered supplies to places where mm -hmm. they had no other way to get supplies there. And uh, uh, it's just about everything mm -hmm. like that, yeah. Now, when you were stationed out in the Pacific, did you encounter uh, Native population? Oh, yes, yeah. And what were they like? Well, they're, they were pretty, pretty Native. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they uh, dressed for comfort, which means very little. Mm -hmm. uh, we, that, that was another advantage to flying seaplanes. We could go into places where the natives didn't have much contact with anybody else. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was one place called Stewart Islands, which is maybe uh, two or 300 miles from Guadalcanal, just a little tiny atoll. And we used to fly over it on our patrols. And mm -hmm. we, we'd throw out magazines and mm -hmm. stuff like that to them. And uh, then one day my pilot said, why don't we land? Of course, we, we would have gotten thrown in jail if anybody <laughs> ever found out about it. But we landed on the lagoon there, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, they came out and greeted us, and we went ashore for an hour or two. And uh, mm -hmm. there was one, one man there who could speak a few words of English. The rest were strictly natives, just mm -hmm. like you read in the books. And uh, they lived on the land, you know, in the water, the fish and mm -hmm. whatnot. But they were very friendly. and. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, uh, we got got to do that. Couldn't have done that otherwise. So. Okay. Uh, earlier, you mentioned uh, rescues, and before the interview, you showed me a photo of a rescue in progress. Tell mm -hmm. us about that. Well, this this developed uh, very early on in our first tour. Uh, it, it wasn't organized at all. It was kind of haphazard. If if somebody would uh, get shot down or otherwise get in the water and uh, we knew about it, mm -hmm. well, we'd go in and try to pick them up. Uh, sometimes it was uh, kind of uh, exciting because it, they tended to be near enemy f uh, facilities and uh, you're likely to get shot at while you were rescuing somebody. Mm -hmm. And uh, they told us uh, we didn't have to go. If, if it was too dangerous, we didn't have to go. But nobody has refused yet, so, mm -hmm. <laughs> so you really, you really you couldn't leave a, people out there right. mm -hmm. exposed. You had to go in and get them. Mm -hmm. And so we'd land in the water and uh, go in and uh, get those guys aboard and get out of there. So, and we, we did. Mm -hmm. Several of those. It was, as I say, it was a little haphazard. It, by the end of the second tour, this had gotten down uh, to a, a routine. So, uh, if if a fighter plane or or bomber got damaged, he would try to make it offshore and land mm -hmm. in the crash land in the water, and then one of the, his planes and his group would follow him down and locate them, and then call in a fast land plane to come and stay with them until we could get there. We'd, we'd be probably on, uh, at some base nearby just right. waiting to be called. Mm -hmm. And they'd call us. It'd take us a while to get there, depending how far it was. Mm -hmm. And then our guys would go in and, and pick them up. And, uh, you mentioned one rescue in particular in which a, uh, there was a general. General Nathan Twining, mm -hmm. I don't know his exact position, but he was in the Army Air, Army Air Corps, it was at that time. Mm -hmm. And they were uh, in a B-17 going, I, 
I presume, to the to Guadalcanal or somewhere in the Solomons. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think what happened is they got lost and they ran out of fuel. Mm -hmm. And after six days, somebody found them out there. Mm -hmm. So they called in, uh, they called it Dumbo. That was a, our nickname. Mm -hmm. They called in Dumbo to come and pick them up. So, yeah. So uh, it, was, it was fortunate, you mm -hmm. know. But the, the Air Force guys didn't have the navigation training that we had. And not only that, their planes didn't have the good compasses that we had. Mm -hmm. They had so much metal and guns and whatnot in those B-17s that the compasses weren't very reliable. Mm -hmm. So they had, they had a little problem navigating over open water. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, so th that, that wasn't unusual. Okay. We actually went for a little while. We took turns flying with them to help them with mm -hmm. the navigation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have been to Guadalcanal and the Solomons. Did you see any of the, the, the damage inflicted? Not really. I was never actually on Guadalcanal. I mm -hmm. flew by it and yeah. up and down the, what they call the slot. There the are slot. sort of two rows of long, narrow islands. And the in between them, mm -hmm. they called it the slot. And I spent many, many, many trips there. But I didn't actually see Guadalcanal. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't actually set foot on Guadalcanal. Right. And, uh, but uh, we got reports, especially early on, we'd get a report every morning on what was going on on Guadalcanal and just how far they had advanced or vice versa. And uh, so we knew pretty well what, what was happening. And it was a, a very difficult time for those guys. They, mm -hmm. they, they had a hard job, the Marines and the, mm -hmm. and the Army. Mm -hmm. So you were at least able to keep up with what was going on in the war? Yes. Mm -hmm. they, uh, uh, I don't know how the communications worked, but mm -hmm. somehow or other we would get a morning report mm -hmm. every day on what was happening up on the island. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how about um, with other uh, theaters of operation, uh, Europe, um, Africa, were you getting regular reports about them? Oh, I think the same thing that people in the back in the States got, yeah. yeah. And did you get like Stars and Stripes? And you were mentioning, you were mentioning magazines. Yeah, I remember Life magazine. That was a big magazine mm -hmm. in those days. We, we dropped it to the natives. And then <laughs> when we landed that day, because they flocked in and mm -hmm. swarmed us down with bananas and mm -hmm. coconuts and all kind of things. And uh, we couldn't take them back because that would give it away that we had landed there. Oh dear. <laughs> so we had to throw them all <laughs> overboard. <laughs> uh, so. Tell us a little bit about uh, the folks you flew with, your, the crew. Well, they're, they came from all walks of life. Uh, and uh, the, the officers all had been through either the same kind of fairly hurry up training that I went through or they had been in the Navy for a while before that and gone through training um, in the years before the war started. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, the, in a way they were the same, but of course they're all individuals and they had all kinds mm -hmm. of people. And then the crews were the sailors uh, were from all walks of life, and I remember we had a radar man. We, we did, the second tour, we had a little better radar. The first one, the radar was almost useless, and mm -hmm. uh, it was a little better with our newer airplanes. But I remember one day, we were flying in, the, in amongst all those islands, and these are mountainous islands, mm -hmm. so you've got to be careful you don't run into a mountain. And uh, it was a terrible weather day with no visibility whatsoever. And all at once the plane filled up with smoke. Well, that's about the oh, scariest dear. thing uh -huh. you can imagine. But the radar man, who was a lawyer from Chicago, took, he turned it off, took it all apart, spread it out, and found what was wrong, put it back together. And it would run about five minutes, and then it would start to smoke again. 
And so we flew along and <laughs> on and off with the radar to try to avoid the mountains. So uh, you were basically flying blind inside so we and had outside. A, <laughs> a, a good liar taking care of our <laughs> radar. <laughs> good yeah, heavens. Yeah. Any other um, character that stands out in your memory? Um, oh, I don't know. There were a lot of it was kind of monotonous because mm -hmm. we. Our typical flight would be anywhere from nine to 12 hours. And uh, most of it was just monotonous, mm -hmm. but you had to be alert all the time. Right. And, uh, you know, we didn't fly every day, but we'd average maybe one flight in every third day or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, a, lot, a lot of uh, repetition, monotony, intermixed with a few moments of terror. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, Did and, you have uh, anything to break up the monotony? Uh, any uh, downtime, recreation time? Um, well, when, when we weren't flying, we had some duties mm -hmm. back at the squadron or, I mean, everybody had ground jobs. Uh, mm -hmm. I was engineering officer for a while and then when we got our magnetic equipment, I was in charge of that. So there was a lot of work, mm -hmm. a lot of training. Navy and military is mostly training. Train, train, train. Mm -hmm. So um, there's always that, uh, those ground duties to, to take care of. Okay. And, uh, so when did your second tour end? It was uh, uh, sometime in the summer of, uh, 44. Okay. So what happened after that? Then I was, well, I got back to San Francisco, and mm -hmm. which is a story in itself, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, uh, they said, oh, this is great. Where would you like to go? I said, I don't care. Any place that's cool in wintertime, mm -hmm. fine. You go home for a month on leave and we'll let you know. <laughs> So they sent me to Banana River, Florida, <laughs> which wasn't exactly cool. <laughs> so I spent a year down there uh, instructing in uh, straight seaplanes again, but they were much larger, the PBM, okay. uh, Martin Mariner, and it was a new, mm -hmm. more, much larger, beautiful uh, airplane, a much sturdier for landing in the ocean and whatnot. So, and for the record, where is Banana River, Florida? Banana River is just a few miles south of Cape Canaveral, okay. which was a desolate area with nothing but sagebrush and rattlesnakes at that time. Oh so. dear. <laughs> <laughs> and what's Banana River now? <gasps> it's an air. Air Force installation mm -hmm. that, where we were, you know. I was, I was ready, oh yeah, it's part of Disney World now. <gasps> no, it's, a, it's on the coast straight east of Orlando, okay. uh, about mm -hmm. 50 miles, yeah. So uh, how long were you down in Banana River, about a year? One year. One mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. And what happened after that? I got out. You got out. Okay. I stayed in reserve for a little while. But, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so that brings us to 45. Do you remember what happened uh, when Roosevelt died? Yeah. Um, it wasn't a complete surprise because he, he was not in good health and everybody mm -hmm. knew it. And, uh, so, uh, and we, of course, we didn't know Truman very much, so we had some doubts about him. And, uh, I was on the other side politically, but in retrospect, I think they both did a good job. Roosevelt was good at getting people fired up to, to for the enormous military production that we uh, developed, and then Truman made some some uh, world class decisions. I have to give him credit for that. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. How about when the atomic bomb was dropped? This is now August 1945. That was a, a great thing because we were anticipating a very enormous, deadly invasion of Japan. And uh, 
that we realized was going to eliminate that, and that was a wonderful thing at mm -hmm. the time. Now, in retrospect, people question it. And of course, it wasn't a happy thing, but all in all, it was the only decision that could be made at the time. You know. Okay. So, um, when did you leave the mil military? I left, uh, oh, I think September of 45. Okay. And what rank were you? Well, I had, I was a lieutenant, mm -hmm. and I had, right after that, I got a letter that promoted me to lieutenant commander, mm -hmm. but I didn't want to go back in, so I never even responded to it. So officially, mm -hmm. I'm a, I ended up as a lieutenant. Yeah. Okay. And did you receive any accommodations or medals? Uh, just the uh, presidential unit commendation. Mm -hmm. And you were telling me before the interview that you actually qualified for an air medal or more than one air medal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I suppose people laugh. They, don't, they wouldn't believe that. But mm -hmm. I have a letter that shows. Uh, if, but mm -hmm. it w I don't know. At, at the time, this was only, I guess probably Korea had happened by then. It was mm -hmm. years, a very few years after World War II ended. And... Uh, you know, I was established in business then, and uh, I didn't want to go back in, I must say. <laughs> so I, I didn't even respond. <laughs> well, you were telling me that you had qualified for an air medal, provided you had... Uh, it was, uh, I forget the exact wording, but essentially, if you had five uh, flights where enemy action might be mm -hmm. expected, you could, you could uh, get an air medal, and I had far, far more than that. So <laughs> you would have had the fruit salad <laughs> rolled down the chest. Yeah. No. What were your feelings about coming home? Oh, it was wonderful. I, now, home I, by this time was this uh, ba around Boston? Yeah, okay. my my wife was in West Bridgewater. Yeah. But just just getting to the U.S., I tell the story about coming in. We came from Hawaii on a ship and uh, we were coming in to San Francisco mm -hmm. early in the morning and it was extremely foggy. Mm -hmm. We could hear a fog, we were up on the bow of this little yeah. aircraft carrier. We could hear a foghorn over on the right and then we could hear fog over on the left. Mm -hmm. So we knew we were coming in the Golden mm -hmm. Gate. And then pretty soon you could hear cars overhead on the bridge. Yeah. You couldn't. You couldn't see them, but you could hear them. <laughs> and then we got past the bridge and the sun came out and it was just oh. the most... <laughs> it was, it was mm -hmm. a really unbelievable feeling. Mm -hmm. I, I've told, I, I told that story to the kids in, in Westwood. <laughs> I, can't, I can't get through that story. Yeah. <laughs> But I tell you, there's no place like the USA. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that you were you married by this time? Yeah, I got we got married uh, right after I got out of flight school. Mm -hmm. So there were stretches where she didn't see you for a long time. Yeah, I, I was gone several months the first time, then I got back in time to see our have our first baby born out mm -hmm. in San Diego, and then. Uh, I was gone again for yeah. most of a year. And that, th that's a story in itself, you know, that people don't think about the wives left at home, but they, they sure did their part. And mm -hmm. it was very difficult in there. Because we had the communications, you know, we didn't, didn't have email. And uh, mm -hmm. it was about a month for a letter to get mm -hmm. one way or the other. So that means two months between a question and the answer. Wow. And, uh, so the girls were on their own, and mm -hmm. it wasn't easy. No, uh, and what was your wife's name? Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, after you get out, did you join any veterans organizations? No. 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 It did mention the reserve. I stayed in the reserve for 
a few years, maybe uh, maybe as many as five. Mm -hmm. And we flew weekends out at Squanum. We'd get to take a Navy plane and go off somewhere. And, you know. mm -hmm. and how long did, uh, did you fly? Oh, up until a few years ago. You know. mm -hmm. Off and on. Just, just I, I had the opportunity to go into commercial flying, but mm -hmm. after flying 12 hours at a time out there, day in and day out, uh, it. It didn't look real appealing. Can't no. say I blame you. <laughs> <laughs> and did you uh, take advantage of the GI Bill or any other veterans' yes, benefits? Yes, I did. Yeah. Okay. I went to uh, actually went to MIT on GI mm -hmm. Bill, uh, and I, I I tell the story about it. I used to think college was just for the rich kids, but there were people that got to go because of the GI Bill who uh, turned out to be very successful and, mm -hmm. and had lives that they never would have had without the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. One guy I used to commute with ended up being a head of uh, locomotive division of General Electric, mm -hmm. and he, he was elected to the, to the Transportation Hall of Fame. Wow. I thought, I mean, here, this guy wouldn't have even had a nickel's worth of college if mm -hmm. it hadn't been for the GI Bill. Mm. You mentioned business. Uh, what did you uh, What did you do? I was an engineer. engineer. Uh, I worked at GE on uh, jet engines for a little while, and then when that group moved to Ohio, I I didn't think my wife would want to live in Ohio, mm -hmm. so I decided to leave the company and I went to work for a, a company that was owned by a professor at MIT and. Uh, we eventually bought the company, and mm -hmm. we had that. Mm -hmm. What was the name of the company? It was at that time it was called Lascelles and Associates. It was Professor John Lascelles had founded mm -hmm. it. And what did you do there besides run the company? <laughs> uh, uh, it was very interesting. It was all kinds of consulting engineering, mm -hmm. and uh, I. I specialized pretty much in materials and uh, stress analysis, mm -hmm. but we'd had many, many projects, a lot of variety, and like I tell people, I never got rich or famous, but I sure <laughs> had a good time. <laughs> and we're really nice people to work with. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And how long did you ha um, stay with the company? Um, until I retired, which was, uh, I have to count. That's, that was about 50, well, at least 30 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I, after I retired, I stayed right on for another 10 <laughs> years. So. Yeah. And what are you doing these days? I'm pretty busy. I I have my own. I still have the old farm from Nebraska, and I do the bookkeeping and stuff on that, and wow. make some of the decisions. But. Uh, other than that, I just, uh, I'm kind of a Mr. Fix-It in the family, and everybody keeps me busy fixing things. So. How important to you was serving in the military? Well, it was, it was uh, very important, life-changing mm -hmm. life, life activity, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Ronald, is there anything else you'd like to say uh, to those who will be watching this in the future? Um, well, I, 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 I'm not prepared for that, but <laughs> let me think a second. Uh, Go right ahead. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I hate to see us have to go to war ever. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will say that World War II was a little different from the ones we see now because we had no choice. We were attacked. Mm -hmm. We had to go in, and as people were all together on it with a single-minded purpose, and uh, which is not always true with some of the activities we get into. And uh, so, I, I hope we can avoid wars. I th I think they're they're caused by the leaders more than the individual people, and uh, even the Japanese. As terrible as they were 
to us in the war. I think the ordinary people there were only doing what they were forced to do and what they were sort of brainwashed into doing. But I always said, people are people all over the world, no matter where you go, you get all kinds. And uh, I think there must be ways to avoid uh, military conflict. Mm -hmm. um, well, Ronald Broderick, I thank you so much for coming in and taking part in the Natick Veterans Oral History Project. You had some good stories there. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Much. It was a pleasure. Thank All you right. very much. <laughs> Hope I didn't bore you too much. So. Not by any means. <laughs>